Hello, my name is Raman Muthusamy. I'm the medical director for endoscopy at UCA Medical Center. And it is my distinct pleasure and honor today to uh, interview my uh, colleague, uh, mentor, and most importantly, friend, uh, Dr. Bennett Roth, uh, in this edition of the Meet the Master series for Video GIE. Bennett, uh, good to see you today. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to just take a second and thank the editors for asking me to do this. It's a, indeed an honor, and I uh, want to thank you for the effort and hard work you've put in, and uh, you truly are a great friend. Great. Thanks, Ben. So, so we'll, uh, we'll get started. Uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll take it, I guess, from the beginning here. Uh, how did, uh, you know, uh, tell us about your childhood and upbringing, and, and how did you get involved in medicine? Well, this picture was uh, a little before I was uh, potty trained, so uh, it seems like uh, it was from this date forward that I had an idea I was going to be a doctor. Uh, my mother uh, and father were both uh, products of the, re of the Depression, and so I was the first one in my family to ever go to college and was always interested in uh, a career in medicine, and it just happened, uh, and I'm thrilled that it did. When you look back at the totality of, uh, of your kind of career in medicine, which yeah. continues to this day, of course, but um, you know, what, are, what, are you, uh, what sticks out in your mind? What, what I was fortunate enough to do is, was to participate in almost every area of uh, clinical medicine. Uh, I had an opportunity to practice at a university, academic uh, level, had the opportunity of being in private practice for 18 years. I had the opportunity of getting involved with education, both uh, undergraduate and graduate. And uh, I was uh, involved throughout my career in the administrative side of medicine. Uh, and I was, as we'll discuss, I'm sure, uh, fortunate to get involved both in local uh, societies and hospital administrative uh, activities, as well as those uh, on a national level. Um, had the great privilege of working with wonderful people. Uh, Andy Rooney once said, if you want to get smart, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. And uh, that was easy for me to do because there were a lot of people <laughs> smarter than me. Yeah, no and <laughs> uh, I was able to uh, learn and um, emulate them. And uh, that was a great, great value for me. So we'll start about, uh, we'll get into your uh, to GI, uh, specifically your GI career. So, so what, how did you uh, get interested in GI to start with? Well, originally, when I was in medical school, uh, I thought I would probably migrate into a career in, uh, in cardiology. Uh, the school I was at, Hahnemann Medical University, was uh, very, very strong in cardiology. Uh, and um, it wasn't until I... Uh, moved over to the University of Pennsylvania for my residency that uh, uh, I got to work with and know some of the members of the uh, GI staff there, Sid Cohen, Julie Darren, Frank Brooks, who was the chief. Uh, and um, I think most of us migrate or matriculate into careers based upon uh, identifying with other people in the same career or the same uh, specialty. And these guys were just terrific, and I thought, uh, I, I, I would like this. And the more I looked into GI, the more I realized how varied it was, both from a cognitive standpoint, uh, it, so many different organs and so many different disorders uh, specific to them, uh, as well as the varied ways uh, in which patients uh, with uh, GI disorders present. Uh, it's a constant detective game, and that was fun. Uh, I enjoyed solving problems. When you add on the uh, element of procedural work that is involved with uh, gastroenterology, uh, that was a double bonus uh, as far as I was concerned because I, 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 I'd always thought about, well, maybe I wanted to be a surgeon, but uh, didn't think I had the uh, stamina for that. Um, and uh, this was sort of a, uh, this, an opportunity to um, use uh, uh, physical activity and, and uh, my hands, et cetera, uh, in addition to simply uh, thinking about things. One of the great experiences that I was fortunate enough to, uh, to have in my career was to observe the evolution 
of endoscopy. Uh, we were so different 35, 40 years ago in the way we practice medicine yeah. than we are today. Um, I can give you some examples if you'd like. Sure. Remember, we didn't have Im high, high resolution imagery. Uh, we didn't have CAT scans. We just were starting out at the um, early phases of ultrasound. And uh, so we had some imaging that we could rely upon uh, in evaluating patients. But the way we worked up jaundice, for example, then as opposed to nowadays, I don't think most people who are in medicine would believe. When a person presented with jaundice and we weren't sure whether it was extrahepatic or, or hepatocellular, we did a transhepatic needle stick and drew back on the syringe as we withdrew the needle. And if we hit bile, we injected it and uh, did basically a transhepatic cholangiogram. If we did not hit bile, we assumed it was hepatocellular disease. Yeah. We were not always right. <laughs> um, compare that to what we do today with MRCP and ERCP and so forth. We did things that were, I think, today almost malpractice. Uh, we um, used to do peritoneoscopy. When I, was, when I was a first year, when I was a fellow, and then when I was on the faculty at UCLA initially, uh, we had a little room uh, which was served as both our endoscopy room and our peritoneoscopy room. And we uh, did peritoneoscopies for disorders involving uh, unexplained ascites, uh, possibility of tuberculosis, uh, possibility of cirrhosis, specific point biopsies in the, in the liver because we didn't have any other way of imaging them except looking at them directly uh, in, the, uh, in the abdomen. Uh, and we used Valium and Demerol. Huh. And we had patients who were sort of semi-awake uh, when we did laparoscopy. Yeah. And it wasn't until the surgeons got involved in laparoscopic cholecystectomy that that procedure left the hands of a gastroenterologist. We put on courses, Pete Reynolds, George Bercy, and I put on courses at, uh, in LA here for laparoscopy. So and you'd so close the defects in the sutures Absolutely. and all that stuff? Absolutely, we did yeah. soup to nuts. Yeah. Uh, and there would be two of us, myself and a fellow, uh, and a nurse uh, who was helping us with the sedation. I had an interesting experience re relative to uh, the evolution and how we uh, have to be resourceful in the way we uh, uh, practice medicine. You had an interesting route to get to your fellowship. And oh, I, I right, wanna, And I right. want to talk a little bit about that. Maybe sure. you can tell us how you, be, you ended up at UCLA and the whole uh, picking a fellowship. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I was originally going to go into cardiology, and then I decided on GI. Uh, and I was uh, fortunate to be offered a fellowship at Penn. Uh, now, this was during the height of the Vietnam War, and everybody was being drafted. Uh, if you uh, got accepted to either what was called the Berry Plan uh, or you had uh, some sort of government-sponsored uh, project that uh, you were guaranteed, uh, you could uh, join the public health service and uh, be assigned to one of the, the hospitals uh, for the public health service. And there was a program at the time, uh, the National Heart Disease and Stroke Control Program. And uh, it was merit-based, and so I had to go to New York to be interviewed and so forth. And fortunately, I was offered the opportunity of getting involved with, with this program. And uh, I was um, assigned to the Public Health Service Hospital uh, in Baltimore, which was on the campus uh, of Johns Hopkins. And I got a call from the chief of cardiology at the hospital offering me the opportunity, since I was going to be there for two years doing my service obligation in this research project, of uh, in naming it or including that as the equivalent of a two-year cardiology fellowship. Would I mind doing that? Which, of course, I was very pleased to do. Figured at the very worst, they get double boarded or I go back to being a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. Uh, about six weeks before I was supposed to go in, in July of 1971, President Nixon defunded the program entirely. 
And so I was offered the opportunity of going to one of the hospitals, and the one that they offered me was in Staten Island as a general internist. So my wife and I had decided, well, let's see what Staten Island looks like. And we drove around the place for the better part of a day. And the rents were high. The uh, places we looked at were not very nice. And we were miserable. And I came back and I called and told them that I, I, I wasn't going to go to Staten Island. And I was told that, well, you know, if you resign your commission, you're going to get drafted and go to Vietnam. And I said, I think I'd rather do that than go to Staten Island. <laughs> Shows you what I shows you what I was thinking. So the field of GI has Richard Nixon in Staten Island to That's thank for this. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> As it turned out, about two days later, I got a call from uh, the Surgeon General's office, uh, and they offered me uh, a spot in the hospital in Norfolk, Virginia, which I did gladly accept and had two great years, very helpful growth years and enjoyable years. Um, it was while I was in. Um, Virginia that uh, I gave some thought and to, uh, to not going back to Penn for GI, but to go into UCLA. I had a very close friend who uh, was a few years ahead of me in school and in residency who had done that, gone to UCLA for his GI fellowship, Richard Corlin. And um, incidentally, he became ultimately uh, the president of the AMA, so he did quite well for himself uh, over the years. And he raved about the program at UCLA, so I flew out, and that was well before there was anything called a match. And uh, they offered me the spot, and um, I accepted. And then I had to call Penn and tell them that I had changed my mind and wasn't coming back, which caused some consternation on their part for a couple of days until they found a replacement, and we, we re rekindled our close friendships and have maintained that relationship for years. So once you got to UCLA, you had not the traditional fellowship. People were actually referring people to you at UCLA as well, a fellow. Tell us about there's that. A, there's a story behind that, and that I started to mention a moment ago, and that was the, um, at the time I was a fellow, I was, there was one clinical fellow, Gary Gitnick, who's the current chief, uh, co-chief, um, had his own fellow who did research with him and also rotated on some of the clinical uh, services with, with me, covered night duty with me. Um, but I essentially saw every consult uh, and did every procedure uh, at UCLA. We had three scopes. We had a um, regular gastroscope, GIF scope, which had the, about the diameter of your thumb. And to decide on whether someone should be scoped was almost akin to deciding whether someone should go on dialysis or not. It was a major decision because it was no fun. We had a colonoscope, first generation, and we had the first generation of the side viewing duodenoscope. ERCP was just emerging. The just beginning. as a frame of reference, what year are we talking 1973. about 1973. 1973. Six weeks into my fellowship, the gastroscope broke. Now in those days, we didn't have loaners. We didn't even have repair centers in the United States. We had to send the scope back to Japan. And it took six weeks to get it back. And during that time, the only upper scope we had was the side viewer, the, the, the duodenoscope. So I used that for six weeks as my go-to upper scope. So I got quite adept at uh, using that instrument, being able to maneuver around the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. And uh, seeing the, uh, the ampulla was routine for me. It was getting it on FOSS was nothing, because it was how I learned to do endoscopy. And so with uh, ERCP just emerging, there were only a couple of folks in town who had done any. Jay Panish had done a few, Mel Shapiro had done a few, and I think Dick Corlin had done a few. So I started doing them at UCLA and as a fellow. And word got around. And I was getting referrals. Well, essentially, you were self-taught. You were just like yes. you were comfortable. Yeah. So you were yeah. just saying, "Let me." Uh, I did. I did a try I to did one with, and I did one with Dick Corlin. I never had done any with anybody else, uh, but I, you know, I read about it. Joe Geenan was uh, starting his career and had written a few papers uh, in GI endoscopy about technique, uh, and uh, I remember uh, uh, reading those and thinking, I, "I think I can do this," and so I did. 
uh, and I was getting referrals from around town as a fellow. I, I, mean, I can't bill, I can't do any of that stuff, and I don't even know if it was legal. Um, but I started doing procedures. And at this point, the instruments you had were primarily diagnostic, right? Because, I mean, syncterotomy hadn't even really oh, been Oh, yes. Performed this yet, was right? purely diagnostic, and uh, there were no stents uh, or, or uh, uh, needle knives or anything like that. And, of course, we injected a lot of ducts that were obstructed that uh, we didn't drain because we didn't know we had to, and we didn't have any way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So we had to get into the operating room relatively early uh, after finding an obstructed duct. You were mentioning, Ben, during your fellowship that you were essentially the on-call endoscopist for the health system at the time. Uh, and and really, at that point, uh, you were really bringing in endoscopy into the field at that time, right? It was really kind of a non-endoscopic field or minimally endoscopic field at, at, at that yeah, time the, um, in terms of the training. So. When I finished my fellowship, I joined the faculty, and I was the endoscopist. Uh, the other folks in our division were not trained uh, in endoscopy. Uh, we had a, so we had a relationship with the, uh, what was then called the Wadsworth, it's now West uh, LA VA, and uh, the fellows from the VA and myself and this Dr. Gitnick's fellow uh, would uh, have joint conferences. And um, we uh, traded stories and sort of taught ourselves uh, how to do certain things. Um, but uh, it was essentially me either doing or shepherding every endoscopy at UCLA. Now, in those days, it was just UCLA. Now it was uh, the old hospital, which had about 800 beds, uh, pared down over the years, but it was a busy hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we did a lot of procedures, uh, uh, and I had the opportunity to uh, work with, partially help train some of the uh, giants in the field uh, of endoscopy, Dean Jensen, just to name one. Uh, and I was proud to be one of his first teacher, and it's a perfect example of where the student outshines the professor. So, which kind of leads to your next uh, sort of phase of your career is that you finished your fellowship and you joined the faculty here, and tell us about those early years on staff. Yeah, well, I set up the first motility unit that UCLA had had, um, and that was an old-fashioned uh, rotating drum with uh, perfusion catheters. Uh, and um, read the uh, uh, motility studies. We did not have uh, anal rectal motility uh, available to us at that point. F formalized the, uh, the, pro the uh, pr uh, activity in the endoscopy center and the procedural uh, activities uh, and uh, set up what was really the first endoscopy unit, if you would call it that. Dick Corlin had done some of the preliminary work when he was a fellow, and, be, and even after he went into practice, and I sort of carried it on. I was a kind of an anomaly because I really wanted to see as many patients as I could see. Mm -hmm. And so I had the audacity of having two half-day clinics, not just one. And that was how things worked in those days. Yeah. Uh, and I saw a huge number of patients compared to what the tradition had been. Uh, right. to, in terms of how, how much time to spend in clinical practice. Yeah. And eventually you followed your heart in that regard with uh, sort of wanting to see more patients and deliver right. care. And of course that, that led to your transition um, to, you know, sort of private practice uh, in the San Fernando yeah. Valley. Yeah. I, um, I really had a hard decision to make because I, I really loved my time at UCLA uh, from the get-go. And um, it was primarily a financial decision uh, that uh, was based upon the fact that I was married with two kids and uh, LA's an expensive place to live and uh, I didn't come from a family that could help and so I had to make a, a hard, uh, the hard choice of leaving and going into private practice. But I cut a deal uh, where I went into practice initially for half time and continued to run the endoscopy unit uh, spent uh, two to two and a half days a week at UCLA uh, just to make sure that I was making the right decision. And um, even th thereafter, when I decided to stay in private practice, I joined uh, Danny Cole and subsequently uh, Mike Albertson joined the two of us. And we had a very successful 
private practice for many years in the Valley. I still maintained a close relationship with UCLA. I would attend in the clinics when these were still in vogue. Uh, we'd go to the VA and attend with the fellows over there. We'd continue to give some lectures. And I always felt a tug in my heart to, uh, to come back someday in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but and we'll, and we'll my, get to that. Yeah, yeah. So. During, during my years in the Valley, uh, I, needed, uh, I needed an additional form of stimulation, intellectual pursuit, uh, and that led to getting involved in uh, the administrative side and the medical staff side of things in the hospitals uh, that I worked. I was chief of staff uh, at two hospitals uh, in the Valley. Yeah, and around this and time, I think you also got involved initially with the ASG. That's right. Yeah. A fellow uh, and friend of mine, uh, not a fellow, but a, a good friend and mentor uh, of mine, Mel Shapiro, shown here with Barbara Frank, uh, God rest her soul, um, uh, introduced me to uh, the ASGE uh, and to, uh, to Jerry Way, who also became a good friend, mentor, and uh, uh, role model. And um, Jerry was, I think, chairman of the Ch of Standards of Practice Committee at the time. And he was kind enough to put me on the committee or, or serve with me on the committee. And um, it was during that time that I got more and more involved with ASGE. Uh, I was on the Education Committee. Uh, I uh, was on the uh, Membership Committee. I did two stints on the Standards of Practice Committee. During, during the time on Standards of Practice, I had the opportunity to write the first drafts on the treatment, the endoscopic treatment of GI bleeding. Um, I rotated off the committee and Dave Fleischer came on and did a masterful job of uh, cleaning it up and doing and, and uh, editing my manuscript. And uh, that was the first such uh, stand, uh, guideline uh, that was published for that entity. Uh, I also did the first draft on uh, the elements uh, that should be included in, a, in, in an endoscopic report. Uh, because prior to that, it was open-ended. There was no guideline, there was no uh, routine, there was no standard uh, on which to follow what should or shouldn't be included and how it should be included. And so I had the opportunity to write that first manuscript. At that same time, there was growing uh, concern and um, uncertainty as to what the role of endoscopy should or shouldn't be in the practice of clinical medicine. And there were no official guidelines. There was nothing out there uh, to guide any of us. And I was asked to be on a committee chaired by Jack Venice and Paul Kantrowitz. Jack was in Minnesota, Paul in Boston. And along with Arnie Kaplan, and I honestly don't remember if there were some other folks on the committee, but we wrote the first draft on the appropriate use of gastrointestinal endoscopy. And uh, that's been refined and revised over the years, uh, but it was the first such guideline developed by the society uh, for the proper use of, uh, of endoscopy. Uh, I'm very proud of that yeah, document. That's something that's continued on up uh, into the quality indicators of 2015. Right. That's a tradition right. that continues. Right. Ben, right. Uh, before we go forward, you know, I, I think um, you were obviously very busy with uh, practice, doing a lot of other things, administrative roles in your hospitals. Uh, you, you still found a way to get involved in professional societies. I think in today's sort of our view driven world where, you know, maybe people sort of um, wondering, well, do I really have the time? What, what, what did you get out of society membership, and, and how, did that, uh, how did you find enrichment with that? Well, for one thing, I learned a heck of a lot. Being around accomplished specialists, such as those who I met uh, on my committee work, uh, interactions at courses, et cetera, were folks who I, I learned a lot from and became a better doctor uh, as a result. Uh, I also learned uh, a lot about uh, people and about interacting with people, diplomatic ways, smart ways, um, proper ways, uh, and uh, learned a lot about the, uh, the administrative side, not just of medicine, but of any organization. Um, the, uh, 
relationship that I had with Bill Maloney, who was the executive director of ASGE when I was heavily involved, is one that has changed my life. I mean, he was uh, a major influence uh, on uh, my character and my professionalism and my way of looking at things. And uh, he was a great mentor, is a great mentor. Uh, and uh, meeting people like him, people like uh, Dave Fleischer, Emmett Keefe, Jerry Way, Jeff Ponsky, and I won't name any others because they're all there. Uh, uh, they, they taught me how to be who I am today, which was a heck of a lot better than it was before I met them. Uh, and so uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity, and it's an opportunity to um, use your intellect in a different way. I mean, we tend to be rather narrow uh, in our uh, activity as physicians, and this helps to expand and uh, give you an opportunity to use your skills and your intellect uh, for things other than the daily grind of clinical yeah. practice. Industry at times can be quite isolating. You're yes. just kind of doing your right. thing. It's a way to right. kind of... Right. Kind of, you, live in, uh, you live in the dark. Yeah, and you uh, kind of you know break bread and talk with people of similar right. interests. And right. yeah, no, I think that's a very well said right. and a very important point. I think is we're all time challenged, but I think it plays such an important role Absolutely. in our professional career. Absolutely. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, so you started in, in practice, and uh, you know, in the in the early days of endoscopy, uh, you know, you said the equipment was fairly rudimentary and. The accessories were probably equally rudimentary at that time. Or you didn't were, exist. Were, yeah, so tell us a little bit about your early days of yeah. sort of uh, device development. So this uh, uh, little story it goes back to my early um, uh, interaction with Jerry Way. Uh, I was at a committee meeting, Standards of Practice Committee, and the treatment of, G of variceal bleeding with sclerotherapy had just been published and it was from Europe and then from the US, a few studies. And we tried to figure out how, how to best do it. And there was a uh, needle injector that was made by Olympus at the time that was um, reusable, had to be uh, gas sterilized and uh, was rather thick and stiff, and really was uh, made for uh, a semi-rigid esophagoscope, not standard uh, fiber optic endoscopy. Um, so I was with Jerry at a meeting, we were talking about it, and Jerry had the idea he was gonna start to try uh, sclerotherapy by taking two different diameter polyethylene tubes putting one inside the other, and um, taking a needle, cutting off the sharp end, gluing that to the uh, forward tip of the, the inner catheter, and tipping the, and, and uh, uh, gluing the uh, hub of the needle to the backward side. And that way you could slide uh, a smaller sheath, a smaller uh, tube through the larger tube so it acts as a sheath and see if he can make the injector needle. Now, there was no such product on the market at the time. So I got back home, I was in practice at the time, and I got back home and, and I said, well, I think I can do that. So I got some small polyethylene tubing, two different sizes, and glued a needle on and injected. It worked. I mean, it was rather rudimentary. Um, a little too well to your detriment, I heard. Well, so. <laughs> what happened was uh, Mike Sivak was chief at the Cleveland Clinic at the time, and he came out to one of the Southern California GI Society dinner meetings and gave a talk on sclerotherapy. And I, uh, I think I was president of the Southern California GI Society at the time, Endoscopy Society at the time. And uh, so I was in, uh, on the dais, and I had the opportunity to talk and ask questions and so forth. And word got out that I was doing sclerotherapy, that I had made a needle and I was doing it. Well, for the next couple of months, I got every variceal bleeder in town referred to me. It's a big at, town. In Burbank. <laughs> and I was getting slaughtered. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Danny Cole and uh, then Mike Albertson uh, started doing them as well. 
Uh, and um, we certainly didn't want that volume. We, it was killing us. So fortunately, uh, I think it was American Endoscopy Inc. came out with the first inje injected needle. I might be wrong on that. Um, and everybody could now start doing it, thank God. Um, but um, it was an issue of, uh, of need and, and, uh, and response. And that's, you know, that's what led to other things. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, whatever corner of the globe you go to, I think you'll, you'll see the device that bears your name, the, the, the Rothnet. And when I tell people I'm from UCLA, you know, people from everywhere will say, oh, yeah. so do you know Dr. Roth? Because this is utilized so widely. Ben, tell us a little bit about uh, yeah. the development of the Rothnet. So uh, need is the mother of, uh, of inventions. And... Uh, we were having a hard time with uh, removing polyps, uh, retrieving polyps. Um, if they were really large, the only thing that really we could use was a, uh, was a snare. And when you came around corners or folds or through the anal orifice, half the time they would fall off or you'd bisect them. And then your pathology interpretation was made more difficult. The uh, other issues were uh, removing polyps that you had taken out in a piecemeal fashion. In those days, we had to suction them or grasp them uh, a piece at a time, take the scope out, reinsert the scope, get, get another piece, pull it out, reinsert the scope. If we took, uh, retrieve polyps by suctioning, the uh, uh, lens of the scope was uh, obstructed, uh, obviously, uh, and you couldn't see anything. So as you withdrew the scope, you'd have the polyp uh, uh, in your grasp, but you'd not had a good look at the colon on the way out, so again, you had to put it back and really redo your colonoscopy. Watching one of those fishing shows uh, one day, and they had a fishing net, and they had the fish up to the side of the boat, and they took the net and grabbed it and pulled it into the boat. And I said to myself, we should be able to do that. It doesn't look tough. So. Uh, a friend of mine introduced me to Marlon Yonker, who at the time had just uh, was, was in the process of selling his company. Uh, he made endoscopic accessories. Um, and uh, I presented him with uh, the idea and a drawing that we see up here. That was the original drawing that I used to pitch my, my thoughts. And he thought it was a great idea, but we could not figure out how to manufacture it. The uh, concern was uh, we were initially using a plastic little um, uh, netting-like material and that we were bonding to a snare with ultrasound and some other techniques, but it, w it didn't work. It was too thick. It was too stiff. And the, the project sort of went uh, silent for a couple of years. It didn't go anywhere. And I just w assumed it was a good idea, but can't figure out how to make it. So I saw Marlin about two years later at a, um, a, a AORN convention in Long Beach that I was speaking at. And he was uh, showing, he was in the exhibit area showing a um, device for the removal or re retrieval of the gallbladder once you take out the gallbladder at the time of laparoscopy. And it was a rubber ba basket, more or less, that was attached to an, a spring that allowed you to open and close it. And I went over and saw him, and we rec he recognized me. I said, Marley, isn't that the concept that we've been trying? And he says, yeah, but we've got to figure out how to do it. He says, maybe I have an idea. And sure enough, uh, Dean Seacrest, who was his R&D guy at this new company he f uh, formed called the uh, uh, US Endoscopy, uh, went over uh, to a bridal store and bought some bridal netting. And we took a snare and weaved the netting over the snare and put it into a open enclosure device like we see here and made the net. Within three weeks, Marlin was in my office in Burbank from Ohio uh, with uh, half a dozen prototypes. And uh, our viewers may be shocked, but in those days, you didn't have to get special FDA approval and things like that for these kinds of devices. And so th the next day, I used four of them in patients. Wow. And they worked like a charm. 
So and within so a month of the time of you having that conversation, we had a prototype that was working. You were able to actually use it. In I patient. used it in patients. It's amazing. Yeah. And so uh, we ultimately did get a uh, FDA approval to manufacture this device. And the rest is history. Over the years, we've modified it, we've improved upon it, we've uh, strengthened it, made it more reliable, more durable, yeah. uh, and more usable. Yeah. Here's um, a group of people who are thankful that's for where, you. That's <laughs> two th they're, they're, they, uh, at the plant in Ohio where they make it. You can see me in the center there. Uh, they have 24-hour uh, shifts, eight, three eight-hour shifts. And this was two of the shifts when I visited there not too long ago, in 2015. Uh, that are dedicated solely to making the, uh, the Rothnet. So I was uh, very, very grateful to uh, the company and uh, the people who were there uh, for helping to develop this. Yeah, his elegance and simplicity remains a yes, bestseller. Absolutely. Several decades absolutely. later. Absolutely. Um, so around this time, in addition to your sort of device development, uh, you were continuing to get involved with, uh, you know, further the ASG, and particularly you were starting to get involved with, as you're saying, you're really at the cutting edge of endoscopy, developing new devices, new tools. The field is starting to, to really take off. And uh, tell us about kind of how you were educating our colleagues uh, about sort of what you were up to. So we had the traditional courses, uh, a midwinter course and a course at DDW every year. And um, I had uh, the, uh, the honor of uh, being the medical director for the uh, midwinter course when Gene Overholt was president. Um, and then I was asked to be the um, chairman of the, uh, uh, the ASG Learning Center Committee, which consisted of me. <laughs> and um, in those days, what we would do uh, was to ask for people to send us slides of uh, endoscopic findings. Uh, and we would put those together by topic or by procedure uh, into a uh, program uh, that was then used at what was called the ASGE Learning Center at DDW. And in those days, it was all done by slide carousel. So we would get a bunch of slides, go through them, pick the ones that uh, looked uh, useful, and then try to put a program to together based upon disease entity or uh, procedure type or what have you. And uh, I vividly remember my wife and I, uh, the night before DDW began that year, uh, going to, we had about 25 or 30 carousels. And um, we loaded, hand-loaded slides into each one. Uh, for the ASGE Learning Center and then had to take them all out when DDW ended and put them back and save them and not let them get so lost. I guess you're glad that PowerPoint came along. Yeah. <laughs> much, much better and even better with DVDs and things like that. Right. Um, that so continues uh, to be a very popular a attraction yeah, at ASGE It is DVW. and it's grown and, and changed so much uh, since those early days. So uh, I know that around this time uh, you were involved with some of the regional endoscopic societies and, uh, and um, you know, tell us about that and, and, and how that led to, you know, kind of you getting further involved with the ASG. Yeah, there was a, uh, uh, an organization that preceded my involvement with ASGE uh, for several years uh, called the Council of Regional Endoscopic Societies. And um, it was uh, made up of several of the smaller uh, local societies who would have a representative uh, meet with uh, at a certain time each year. Uh, and they had uh, an elected chief or president or uh, director uh, that was uh, elected each year or every two years. Uh, and that individual had a seat on the ASGE governing board. I was then asked to be the chief of the Council of Regional Societies and uh, went on the board. And we tried to figure out a way to utilize this organization as a partner uh, or um, extension of the uh, ASGE. And uh, I spent a year uh, putting together 
directors in different regions to uh, meet and to um, discuss common issues or issues that were unique to an area and uh, uh, could ultimately need, be needed elsewhere. Um, and I realized in short time that the organization of the council, of, which was called CRESS, uh, was redundant and duplicative and unneeded. And uh, Mike Sivak was president uh, of ASGE at the time, and I call, remember calling him up and saying, Mike, this is silly. We should just disband it. The ASGE is doing everything that the CRESS organization wants to do or uh, originally intended to do. The ASGE is bigger, richer, smarter, more representative, and it should just take on whatever activities that CRESS is doing. So Mike said, well, you realize that would mean you had to come off the governing board. I said, that's fine. <laughs> that's appropriate. So as it turned out, uh, everybody's agreed, and um, Cress was taken out of existence. And they asked me to serve on the governing board as a counselor. So gotcha. that was very now nice. These regional them. societies really you know, had a tremendous yeah. amount of talent. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. was... Uh, I think the 50th uh, sort of reunion of uh, a group that founded the Southern California Society of Gastroenterology. And uh, yeah. I know you're in the back here, but in the front, uh, you know, we have three ASG presidents. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Jerry Way was invited to come visit, right. but uh, Jay Panish, and of course, Mel. as you mentioned, Mel Shapiro, and of course, you mentioned your friend Dick Corlin, who was uh, an president AMA president AMA, as right. well. So. So certainly uh, we have a lot of uh, leadership yeah. nationally from yeah. our Southern This California. is a very auspicious group. These are all guys who were involved in the early days of the Southern California Society that started originally as the uh, Southern California Gastro Camera Club. Mm. And we met at Mel Shapiro's house. Um, I forget, uh, maybe once a month or once every two months. Mm -hmm. And um, we would bring pictures that we had taken of endoscopic findings because we had no idea what we were looking at. There was no textbook, there was no atlas, there was nothing. We were starting off. And they'd, we'd sit around a room and, and look at these pictures and name or give names to what we were seeing. And someone would say, oh, I had a similar uh, experience or I had a similar finding, et cetera. And that's how this all started. And it was he morphed into the Southern California Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, which over the years morphed with the uh, local society that was a wing uh, of uh, AGA into the Southern California GI Society. So it does both. But uh, Jerry, uh, who was one of our earliest um, speakers, uh, is very close to Mel and to Jay. Uh, and, um, was invited to this luncheon, which uh, was a bunch of old fogies um, uh, getting together for a reunion of the early days of the uh, of the society. Yeah. Uh, and I got to give them a lot of credit. They um, they were the uh, the pioneers. Yeah. A lot of giants were. here, yes. regionally and nationally. Right. So right. yeah, right. no, absolutely. Right. So you said uh, you know you disbanded this, but uh, got back onto the council. Uh, and then uh, continued on in your leadership roles in ASG? Yeah, I uh, was very fortunate um, to have uh, been nominated and uh, uh, agreed to serve as uh, president of ASGE um, and uh, worked with, uh, when Dave Fleischer was president, I was president-elect and got to work a lot with him and one of my favorite people. Um, and then when I was president, worked with uh, Emmett Keefe, who followed me, who was also a dear friend and a, and a wonderful guy. Uh, and um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, spent a lot of time with Bill Maloney, who was the executive director, who uh, I learned a lot from and uh, loved dearly. And you eventually, obviously, in your year as presidency uh, as ASG, I know you had some initiatives that, uh, yeah. that um, you worked on that you're proud of. Yeah, there, there was... <laughs> There, was, there were two major initiatives that I was a major signature on from ASG's standpoint. One was the 
uh, Federation of uh, Gastroenterological Societies, and that was uh, a organization that was uh, developed with the original intent and the uh, notion that we would be able to streamline our fundraising and development uh, process by working in uh, 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 cahoots with uh, uh, the AGA and the ASLD. And uh, so we met several times over the course of uh, my year as president and the year prior to that when Dave Fleischer was president. Um, with Marty Brotman and uh, uh, Don Powell from Carolina, uh, Neil Kaplowitz from the ASLD, um, Tachi Yamada uh, was the age, one of the AGA reps, Jeff Ponsky also represented the uh, ASGE in addition to myself. And we put together this organization, uh, but over the years it unfortunately did not succeed. Uh, there was um, a lot of, um, uh, I would say, in many ways, needed partisanship in order for the organizations individually to survive. And there were differences in the, uh, the message and the uh, uh, programs uh, that we each put on. So that organization lasted a few years, but then faded away. An organization that did not fade away that I'm m very proud of is CORI, uh, Clinical Outcome Research Initiative, that was originally started when David uh, Fleischer was, was president and Dave Lieberman was involved with the University of, Wash with the University of Oregon uh, in putting it together. And it was during my year that uh, the final papers and the organizational structure was confirmed and solidified and I signed the, uh, the agreements. And uh, that organization lasted over 20 years mm -hmm. and uh, produced hundreds of papers and very worthwhile research that reflected on how practice was really done, not an idealized practice or a university-only academic practice, but how practice activity uh, in the United States and elsewhere uh, was, uh, was carried out and uh, the, the results uh, from everyday uh, yeah. activity rather yeah. than the results that occur only if you're at the university level. Yeah, that, that difference between efficacy at expert centers and right. effectiveness at exactly. real world centers right. is something that I think right. uh, current literature can that was sense. And that was one of the hallmarks of my presidential year uh, that I was trying to get across. I remember vividly when I was uh, director of the midwinter course asking a simple question. And at the time, we were really getting paid very handsomely by uh, Medicare and insurance companies for doing procedures. Uh, we were getting $800 or more for a colonoscopy and six or $700 for a standard endoscopy. Yeah, those were and the that days. Was in the late, <laughs> that was in the late 80s, yeah. early 90s. Right. And then uh, with RV, RVS came the change. And yet, when I was, when I was president of the course, uh, I, when I was director of the course, I um, asked the question of the audience as to if they would acknowledge that our payment for procedures was probably excessive and should be rerouted to the ENM codes that we use. And everyone agreed. Every hand went up in the audience. Now, they may have been hiding behind the, the fact that there was a big crowd and they wouldn't be individually singled out. But it, it, it was it was important that um, yeah. we recognized that um, we had to look at what was being done in the community. We had to look at what was being done in the everyday practice of gastroenterology and endoscopy and um, recognize that uh, the papers and the uh, reports that we were seeing in our journals were not necessarily reflective of what was going on in real life. Mm. I suspect that uh you might get a different survey result today. <laughs> oh, I know I would. I'd be the first one to raise my hand against it. <laughs> right. So we are here as part of Video GIE, and of course it's an entire sort of journal that really is focused on sort of uh, video and uh, based teaching of endoscopy, which as you mentioned earlier, is uh, what really people kind of enjoy seeing. Right. Um, and I know that you were involved in really some of the earliest sort of uh, video based education for endoscopy. This pro process and these programs um, were originally uh, the brainchild of Mel Shapiro. And um, 
We realized that live courses were fun because more than anything else, you were coming to see a train wreck. You might say in um, public that you were there to learn, but the biggest thrill came when a deemed expert either couldn't get the job done or had a complication or something like that, and people would come home squealing with delight that so-and-so couldn't get to the cecum or whatever. And realized that with the actual take-home nuggets and, and learning experiences were relatively sparse. And it would be far better to have this programmed and edited and produced. And so Mel uh, developed a company called Zephyr Medical. And um, what we did was to uh, go around the country uh, uh, with supporting funds from industry. And uh, we uh, would film recognized experts in their units with sophisticated camera equipment that allowed us to look at the endoscopic image, the fluoroscopic image, or the ultrasound image, as well as the image of uh, the endoscopist's hands uh, and uh, his face, et cetera, and uh, be able to edit it in and out, uh, showing uh, the important points that you wanted to bring out uh, in doing a certain type of procedure. Mm -hmm. And so we would shoot for a day or two sometimes uh, at a place like the Cleveland Clinic and maybe do 15 cases and bring them back, uh, and each one would be anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours, uh, and edit them down to a seven or 10 minute presentation, and um, develop uh, a, a course a program that was done live. Um, and uh, these also were supported by industry. We went around the country doing these programs. So you did this both as live courses as well as video-based education? Well, we did that a little later. They weren't live courses. It was okay. live presentations like, okay. of the videos. Gotcha. And uh, the um, person who we filmed would be there in person and would uh, be there as a, uh, a commentator on what was being seen on the screen with the, uh, the procedure. And I would be there as the moderator and I had a headset on and I was able to communicate with the uh, people in the back who were showing the video. You can see it here. Yeah. yeah. And I had a toggle switch that I could turn on and off and just talk to the people in the back or talk to the audience. And we would have pre-selected times uh, on a time code on the, on the video. And I knew, for example, that at a minute and 32 seconds in, I was going to have them stop and we were going to ask a question or bring out a point or ask for advice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they would be ready to do that. And I would make it seem like it was spontaneous and say, oh, wait a second, Dr. Muthasami, you, you've shown how to get into the bile duct, but ha what are you doing with the catheter? What direction are you pointing at? Mm -hmm. uh, and the folks in the back would know that they had to turn the tape off. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would answer and you had the opportunity to rewind it and, uh, or use a telestrator uh, to show what you were recommending. Really bringing in the didactic and component exactly. of these cases, yeah. And then you would say, okay, let's roll the tape, and yeah. we'd go back to the case. So when did you start making these? Uh, so then we had some uh, 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 additional funding from industry to make these DVDs uh, and um, be able to distribute them for free. Uh, and uh, we made many, many of those. Uh, and they were not all endoscopic, some were didactic. Uh, we did one on eye irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, and uh, when I look back, I think that those courses were the best teaching devices I've ever seen. And you started and, these about over 20 years ago, right? Yeah. These were the mid, mid to yeah. 90s, late 90s? Uh, uh, even, even. Uh, Maybe, yeah, mid-90s, I would say. Yeah, That's about yeah. right. Maybe even So in the spirit early. of uh, sort of video GIE, let's uh, take a look at a couple of these videos and, uh, and uh, kind of demonstrate uh, kind of, you know, kind of what you were able to do back in the day. So, so these videos were made um, by um, photographing, 
<laughs> photographing uh, procedures that were done uh, at endoscopic units around the country, bringing the raw footage back home. Zephyr Medical is the name of Mel uh, Shapiro's uh, organization, and uh, we had video editors, sound people. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the timing really, of a fiber optic scope there. Yeah, yeah so. exactly. And this was an example of the typical um, starting point for one of these discs. Uh, I'm the moderator over here, and uh, uh, we've got Ken Binmuller, Dave Fleischer, Jim Desario, uh, and uh, Worth Boyce, each talking about a different technique uh, for Felix, a different entity. In and this was a typical introduction uh, remark. Are among the most common and frequently treated disorders in gastroenterology. This program is dedicated to the techniques of esophageal dilation utilized in the management of some of these illnesses. This DVD features renowned physicians from across the country. James Desario of the University of Utah performs endoscopic balloon dilation. And what you can dilation. see is we've got the ability to photograph the endoscopist, show a simultaneous vision uh, of the uh, endoscopic finding, uh, and if needed, we can also uh, have a, a dedicated uh, camera for the endoscopic ultrasound or an ERCP fluoroscopy, uh, you name Utilizing Savary dilators. Dr. Kenneth Binmuller of the University of California yeah, so at San see, Diego uh, provides see, well a well-known name was back young, in the day, young young right? Kenneth yeah. dilators in treatment uh, of a distal stricture. All right, so, Ben, it looks like you're scoping here. Uh, tell us about this case. So this was a uh, case of a gentleman with uh, dyspeptic symptoms, and the question was, was it acid reflux induced? Was there peptic ulcer disease? Was there other pathology? Uh, or uh, was this a functional disorder? And the endoscopy, as you can see, uh, uh, we were doing uh, with uh, standard technique and uh, the um, value of this uh, as a teaching tool, obviously, is uh, the ability to narrate as you're uh, going uh, through the process, show the endoscopic image. Uh, if we're doing other kinds of procedures where endoscopic ultrasound uh, is uh, involved or fluoroscopy is involved, such as might be seen with uh, ERCP, of course, uh, we can uh, have additional cameras and have uh, visualization of both uh, the endoscopic and the uh, uh, other findings uh, as we listen to the narrative. You can see there's a hiatal hernia of decent size here. Uh, and uh, this is just there to... Uh, yeah, and so it looks like, yeah, you've obviously got picture in picture and right, able to cover right, all the different right. modalities here. And, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent teaching tool. Because it shows the pathology, it shows the technique, it shows uh, what's normal, what's not normal, and um, uh, it can be reliably repeated and repeated and repeated uh, yeah. with um, the ability to make teaching points to different audiences. Yeah, no, good looking video and good looking endoscopist there as well. Uh, <laughs> well, it shows how the years change you. All That's right. for sure. Very good. Well, this is really, again, a really a modern forerunner to sort what, of what, what we see what all the, the journal, time. What the, and what the, the journal is. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is really this is a, the, the precursor. And really, you can see the level of clarity on the, on the pictures and, uh, and the detail you can see on the scope and in-room views, technical details. So as you mentioned earlier, Ben, eventually UCLA did come a calling. And uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, we were able to get you back. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I maintained a relationship and a fondness for the uh, UCLA uh, Division of Digestive Diseases, even though I was in practice for many years. I did get a uh, call from Gary uh, Gitnick asking if I would consider coming back on the faculty uh, and assuming the role of uh, clinical chief uh, of the uh, division. And so I did, uh, initially in a part-time, half-time position, uh, during which I came down and saw patients a couple days a week, did procedures once or twice a week, and sort of got a feel for what the division was all about and whether this was a good fit uh, for me. Uh, and after uh, six to eight months, I realized this is what I love to do. And uh, by the end of the year, uh, we solidified a, uh, a deal where I returned full-time uh, 
much to the uh, chagrin of my partners, uh, who, by the way, over the years since, have joined the faculty and is our UCLA faculty now uh, as well, um, and um, took over the role of uh, clinical chief uh, and director of endoscopy uh, over the course of uh, time. Uh, I served briefly as the uh, director of the training program. During that time, the division grew enormously, and uh, we have a bunch of satellite practices now throughout Southern California, ranging from uh, the Northwest uh, San Fernando Valley and beyond uh, to the South Bay area uh, and uh, growing as we speak. The liver program has grown enormously. We have uh, gone from one hepatologist to I believe we have six or seven now. Um, and uh, we're intimately involved with the Department of Surgery and the Transplant Program uh, in our liver program. Um, we recognized the need for uh, dedicated interventional endoscopists and are pleased and delighted to have recruited you as uh, our chief, and you've brought in three or four additional people uh, since your arrival. Uh, the program is immense uh, and is growing very rapidly and very successfully, and I couldn't be more happy for you and for the, the division. We developed the um, uh, Melenkov course, which uh, was initially conceived of uh, at the time of the 50th anniversary of the division. Sherm Melenkopf was the dean uh, of the School of Medicine, the longest uh, reigning dean in any medical school ever uh, until he retired and unfortunately subsequently passed on. Um, he founded the GI division, was probably the best clinician I've ever been in the presence of. Uh, he taught us how to really take a history. I remember being the only fellow uh, the year I was a fellow, and we had one day a week where we made rounds with Sir Melenkov. And he'd spend two hours with one patient. And I was getting phone calls uh, back and forth about seeing more consults and more consults, and can you see this and can you do this? But I was there with Sherm and I couldn't. And as much as we complained about that uh, at the time, uh, it was the best clinical learning experience that I can imagine. Uh, he was just the best clinician you'd ever see. Yeah. Well, a lot of that rubbed off on you because I have to tell you, uh, you know, when, when we were together, I mean, you come to Pancreas Conference, Esophageal Conference, IVD Conference, General Conference, and, and you always have things to say, you know, at, at all of them that are, and I think as we sort of super specialize in this, that, that sort of gets lost, that sort of yeah. person with the overarching yeah. uh, sort of view. It's a, it's a shame. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think that's uh, an important, uh, right. important thing to try to preserve. Well, we're trying to uh, now build up the, uh, the satellite practices. Yeah. And um, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, uh, even though I retired a couple of years ago, I've uh, spent uh, time uh, speaking with Eric Israeli and our chief and uh, Gary and uh, Gitnik as well about uh, helping out in mentoring and, and uh, helping to uh, grow the, uh, the clinical practices in the satellite offices. And we're going to continue to do that. And they've asked if I would continue to function in that mode, which I'm happy to do. Yeah. It's an important challenge is a lot of academic centers are sort of developing sort of peripheral things, you know. It still blows my mind that you were doing all the endoscopy at UCLA Health as yourself. And, of course, now we have seven endoscopy units. We have so many dozens of people who provide endoscopic services. It's really hard to uh, really to see that the, yeah. the change that has occurred. And certainly that's a, it's something that a worthwhile effort to try to integrate all these distant sites and, and try to make everyone feel as one. So... So, uh, so I know you've had a little bit of time now, at least you can to breathe. Uh, what sort of things uh, have you been doing to keep yourself busy uh, sort of in your semi-retirement? <laughs> well, I've always played golf and I continue to do so. A little easier to find time and uh, not worry about uh, either getting there too late or, or not leaving early enough. Um, uh, always wanted to play the piano and um, 
so I, uh, we have a piano at home, and so I took some piano lessons and did so for about two years. Uh, recently stopped just to not have the obligation of doing homework, uh, but uh, I, uh, I still can, I learned how to play, at least read music, and, uh, and uh, it just takes a lot of practice, but I enjoy it. And um, I've been doing some uh, uh, classes where I'm the student for a change, which is fun. Uh, I've done things through Pierce College and uh, UCLA okay. Extension and so forth, and just topics like the birth of rock and roll and uh, uh, Broadway musicals and uh, headline news and things like that. So it's been it's been fun, and I still very much enjoy coming uh, coming into Westwood and going to the uh, conferences uh, once once or twice a week at least, um, and uh, just seeing old friends and uh, and talking uh, about things. So as we sort of wrap up here, Ben, uh, you know, sort of uh, just wanted to get some some general thoughts as you sort of look back on on your career, and and again, a big part of why we we're doing this is is to provide uh, really uh, pearls of wisdom for the next generation. And so uh, maybe get some of your thoughts uh, as a master in terms yeah. of uh, sort of tips for a successful Well, the first career. thing that, I, that I've always told fellows when they've come to me asking for advice in uh, job choice and so forth is that uh, the likelihood is that this is not going to be your first and only, your, your only job. It'll be maybe your first. But it's not the one necessarily the one you're going to retire from. Uh, things change, uh, needs change. Uh, you got to be prepared for that, and uh, and be ready uh, to make changes if you have to. It's really worthwhile if you can find the time to get involved in um, local organizations, whether it be uh, medicine related or not. Uh, it's very helpful to get involved in your national organization, uh, at least for, for GI, whether it's uh, ASGE or the AGA or the Liver Society uh, or the college or, or all of the societies. You'll meet people with different ideas, people with different training, different uh, views, and different experiences in what they've uh, faced uh, in either practice or academic settings. You can do both. You really can. You can do academic, you can do clinical work in an academic center. You can do academic pursuits in private practice. And there's no reason not to. Uh, it'll keep your mind fresh. It'll keep your intellect uh, strong and growing. And it'll keep you interested. Because it can get bothersome after a while, tiresome after a while just going through the daily grind of clinical practice day in and day out. You need other things, at least I did, and I think most successful people do, uh, to keep your uh, interest and to keep, your, keep you fresh. I think with all the problems we complain about in medicine, it's still the best profession. I can't imagine having done anything else in my life. Uh -huh. yeah, that's really uh, great advice, I think, uh, something we can all and utilize and uh, a good perspective. And I really, really want to thank you for uh, your time and really uh, sharing your wisdom and uh, really a fascinating story about the history of endoscopy and yeah. uh, sort of how it sort of developed uh, sort of in parallel and hearing it uh, you know, within our region and, and how it's gone from device development and your career through sort of community practice, back to academic practice, to current training, teaching, education, really, it's really a remarkable career. And so Ben, uh, thanks so much for your time. And, Thank uh, you. Great, uh, and so with that, uh, we'll uh, close uh, this Meet the Master session with Dr. Bennett Roth. Uh, I'm Raman Mutasami, and uh, I wanna thank uh, Video GIE and ASGE for the opportunity uh, today. Thank you.